Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace of Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And thus he's liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Mitchell Wiecek, who's coming in from Florida. He is an agorist, anarchist, graphic artist, and meme creator. His Facebook pages are Agorist Ball, Anarchy Ball, uh, My Big Fat Balls, and Captain Anarchy, his newest baby. <laughs> um, he's, al- he's also on Twitter uh, at Agorist Ball you can find him there um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this one website that he's associated with uh, it's called Icha Foundation I-C-H-A foundation.com uh, so we'll talk about that and um, you know and some other things so uh, Mitchell thanks a lot for coming on the show hey it's good to, it's good to be on here Danilo yeah, yeah, I've been uh, I've been a contributor to Agris Ball for a while now, um, and I really enjoyed it. and And I think when I first started, you know, you 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 had very, you know, I, I had more likes than you, basically, right? And then you, you just you, like you just like <laughs> shot past me. <laughs> you you did, and um, and none of that was expected. Like, um, I remember I added you on because I thought, oh, that'd be a good idea to bring likes our way, because you know he had, his show was on BVN. He was a cool guy, and. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, it was it was hilarious to just watch that happen. It was, <laughs> it, it's that's honestly what pushed me into graphic arts as what I what I want to do for a living, what I am doing for a living. Awesome, yeah, 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 yeah. You do the uh, yeah the um, the cartoons and the and the, the comic the comic with the balls and uh, which is awesome. I you know a lot of people love those yeah. things, um, and I think it's a great way to spread the message. You know, like so many other people use different platforms, like you know, blogging, article writing, podcasting, rapping. Um, you know, being an author, writing books, you know, so the comics is just another way uh, to do that. And it's just awesome. Um, and, you know, I, I we interviewed on Seeds of Liberty, this woman, um, uh, Brittany Schaefer. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She wrote this comic book called The, uh, the Urban Yogini, which is like a superhero that can't um, that can't use violence. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. It's like it has to, has to conform to the non-aggression principle. And then, and then you have... Um, uh jamie lloyd i think his name jack lloyd um uh who who made the volunteers comic Did, have you seen that Vol- yeah he's a he's actually a good friend of mine cool yeah yeah he's an awesome guy so yeah so the comic i'm really happy to see people using this comic book platform to uh you know to uh promote the message you know the more the better um so before we get into that um please uh talk a little bit about your history how you how you came to anarchy and agorism? Oh man, that's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I grew up mainly um, a hardcore like Republican. I that's just the family I was grown. Well, at least on my dad's side. Um, literally, if you know my last name at all, and you live in Michigan, you know my uncle as the guy who um, ran for office under the Republican Party a few few years back and Mayor Warren. But um, great uncle, but. Um, Eventually, somewhere after 2008, I just got very disenfranchised with the system. I started to really see that for the sham it really was. Um, I think really the first thing I noticed was Obama beating George Bush's record for medical marijuana raids in his first term. And from there, I really didn't expect this, but I, you know, I got to give credit to some private schools out there. They do a good job with their education. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to get a private education for a few years of high school. And um, in that, I ended up reading George Orwell's uh, Animal Farm. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> first, at first glance, I'm, I'm thinking, like, this guy's a socialist. This is going to fucking suck. 
But no, no, no. It was it was a really great novel. And um, aside from proving as an allegory for what happened to the Soviet Union, I really think you can look at almost all cycles of government and take something from that. Mm -hmm. Those who seek to do something good eventually become the pigs, eventually become the humans that they got rid of. Eventually, mm -hmm. the pig. Spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but from there, I became very much so a democratic socialist. Um, not like Bernie Sanders, just more of like a George Orwell oriented, or oriented democratic socialist. If you were to ask me at the time, I'd still probably call myself a communist. Hmm. But from there, that eventually led into um, anarcho communism, to which I kept on being called a bourgeois liberal. Hmm. <laughs> Got drawn more to voluntarism after that through um, Ron Paul, out of all people. So, so let me let me just clear uh, something up. Um, so you're 20 years old right now. So in 2008, you were 12, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you started paying you know, attention to politics at 12 years old. Is what you're telling I me, right? Paying attention to politics when I was young. I kept on being told when I was when I was young that why the fuck are you talking about this? You're a little fucking kid. <laughs> that, that's so. Uh, I can remember that, like, well, not in those words, obviously, but I can just remember things like that happening a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely was not thinking about uh, that at 12. For me, it was more like, uh, you know, chess and piano and physics and cosmology and astronomy. I and Star Wars and shit. I, was, I, was, I wasn't just like a loser kid. Was <laughs> a well, loser is a harsh term. I mean, <laughs> there's different levels of, I guess, outcasts, you know. <laughs> that, you know, I guess that's what we all are. We all accept the fact that we're, uh, you know, going against the grain and, uh, you know, choosing a different path, not necessarily because it's easy, um, but because it's moral. Right, and virtuous and uh, you know that's the that's the uh the reason i i take it anyway um but uh but yeah that's really it's really awesome that you you know eventually um came to volunteerism and it's funny through ron paul which is it's just so funny how this politician who is a politician he's not a volunteerist or an anarchist um that he has been he has done arguably m much more than even like murray rothbard you know the greats um ha have done to uh to convince people because you know he's out there like politics is a platform people pay attention to it and um and he used it well yeah another thing with ron is he had a good history to back himself up with the exception of those letters which supposedly came from murray rothbard yeah 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 so yeah that definitely helped out a lot which i which i have to admit definitely was more appealing to me <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah i uh, i like to tell people that well uh, on uh on the seas liberty you know we, we have a occasional confession of sins and i um you know i say i voted for obama in uh 2008 and uh <laughs> you know say it, uh, quote wait. 70 lines from anatomy of the state my child <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, not even to say that was that was that was <laughs> awesome. That's that was mind mind uh, opening for me. Um, yeah, I'll never be be the same after that. Uh, it's amazing how sometimes you read something and you're like, wow, that guy just you know said in 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 words you know what I've been trying to say or what you know what's been in my mind, but I haven't been able to um, you know put it down on paper or or uh, you know just say it like that. Like it's just yeah just crystallizes the thoughts, you know? Yeah. So, so what, what books can you just uh, get into a little bit of, of the books that have uh, influenced you? I'm just curious. We, uh, you know, you said animal farm and, and then some of Murray Rothbard's, I assume, right? Yeah. And, um, the George Orwell will actually come up shortly after this. Um, basically, yeah, with Rothbard, the first, I kept on hearing about him through people in the community and there was one video I had seen in particular of him, which I'm not going to lie, made me laugh my ass off the first time I saw it. Because here I am seeing all these quotes, all these memes and everything, and I was not expecting him to have the voice he did. <laughs> oh, you mean Murray Rothbard's voice? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the guy. But, but, I think he has, yeah, a, for, he has like a comedian's voice, I think. That's, uh, you see, it's 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 a, it's a really interesting voice, that's for sure. It <laughs> right. made for a funny one-act play that he wrote, ripping on Ayn Rand. Right. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah yeah, yeah it's like a, a you know abbott and costello or a, yeah some kind of three stooges type of <laughs> it really is it really is but his points on martin van buren i thought were really good um only as him being the best of the worst presidents uh-huh <laughs> But she, his point, he, he was right. Out of all the ones out there who honestly, out of all the worst, go figure it's the one that we almost never talk about. Well, which one was the one talking about the worst, pre- or the best of the worst, I guess. Yeah, the, the best president. Uh, that's, the way, that's the way Rothbard framed it. To me, to me the best president is the one that, that, that served the least. And I think it was William Henry Harrison who died yeah. uh, like a, a month after he was inaugurated. And he was he was like bedridden the whole, the entire time. <laughs> I would that say I, t- to me he's my hero. He's the best. <laughs> he didn't do anything. That's excellent. You know, it's awesome. <laughs> he went, gave his speech in the rain, got sick, died thirty days later. Right? Yeah. You know, you can't get you can't get much more laissez faire than that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> so so tell me what what um, attracted you about agorism. You know, why, why uh, do you consider yourself, um, you know, an agorist primarily? Uh, shortly after reading Anatomy of the State by Rothbard, I actually read The New Libertarian Manifesto by Sam Leward Konkin. Mm-hmm. And it kind of elaborated in areas that I really, uh, that really just drew me in as someone who was more artistically oriented, someone who wanted to make a living off of their art. And with all these restrictions, like I don't know if you know this, but it's illegal in in Florida, in downtown Orlando, to go down there and just spray paint an an art, do like uh, spray paint. Like I, I got an example right here if you want to see like what I've done in the past. Sure. But um, this sort of thing, you see it booming in New York and stuff. You see it booming all over these places, but here in Orlando, it's not really there. Um, when I know it's there, but. You might have seen like uh, this sort of spray paint space art before. Nice. Yeah. You, you did that? Yes, sir. Cool. Yeah. Not just limited to the worlds of graphic arts. Nice. But yeah, you can't just go downtown and do that and make money off of it. You can't just go to an open park and an open public park and do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's the what's the fine for that? You know. I honestly have no clue. Well, <laughs> they just tell you to shut the fuck down. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, you know, one of the things that reminds me of is, um, you know, Larkin Rose was saying uh, that well, one of the best things, um, you know, best ways to, to change or nullify laws is um, to make them unenforceable, right? And the best way to do that is to make them too dangerous for, for law enforcement to enforce them. Have so, to arrest too many people. That's always the thing that some people have said. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and I believe that's the reason that uh, prohibition was lifted because they just could no longer enforce it. Everyone was just like, <laughs> you know, the black market, I guess, was just getting too large. And and um, and so what? One thing he, you know, Larkin Rose was saying was that you know, if you were to have a, a lemonade stand in front of in front of uh, you know somebody's house with a couple of kids there, and then you were to have like some armed anarchist there, you know, nicely armed. <laughs> and if any any law enforcement uh, fascists try to come by and shut them down, you know, they're like, nope, nope, you're not shutting them down. Oh God, <laughs> that would be wonderful. And uh, I wonder, That'd be if, crazy. I wonder if, if anybody would be willing to do that. But I think that's that's an awesome way to shed light on um, unjust laws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it would be wonderful if all the um busking musicians of Orlando would be willing to all go out there and all the spray paint artists would be willing to go do that because it really it would be unenforceable yeah 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 um i was recently this past weekend in uh in a sporting goods store and uh this kid who was uh, helping us in the in the bike section i got into a conversation with him and uh, he said he's he's going to college now and i said what are you going to study he says criminal justice and I said, so what's what's the uh, you know the end result of that? He's like, oh, I want to be a cop like my like my father. He's a retired cop. And then I I uh, I'm like, really? <laughs> and then so I ask him, um, do you think there are any unjust or immoral laws? And he's like, of course there are. And I'm like, but but as a cop, aren't you sworn to enforce all of them unilaterally? And he's like, no. 
a cop has the discretion to enforce whatever they deem necessary. I'm like, but a law, you know, you can get arre- you get arrested for breaking the law, right? Doesn't matter what kind of a law it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I didn't get a, too much of a chance to talk to him, but I'm like, he's like, no, you have to have probable cause for arrest. I'm like, well, if I have a broken tail light and I resist, you're gonna arrest me, right? Yeah. But but some laws are unjust and moral. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> And he, and, he, and he just smiles. He's like, "That's the U.S." So, sir, <laughs> That's the- please tell me what what jaw jo- what which laws and specifically are uh, unjust and immoral. <laughs> yeah. Which ones? Yeah, I know. And and uh, if I just had a little more time, I would have gotten into the victimless crimes. You know, the idea of victimless crimes, or or even the idea of um, um, how do you what do you call that? Um, you know, crimes basically preventative, like pre crimes, pre crime laws, like seatbelt laws, right? Yeah, the robot or the what's what's the name of that uh, one action movie about that? Yeah, uh, Minority Report. Minority Report. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's a great example of uh, of that kind of thing. That uh, you know how you can get arrested for not having a seatbelt, but you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> you just didn't have hey, a seatbelt. If, if if you want to be stupid as fuck and not wear your seatbelt, go go ahead. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. I mean, I'm gonna wear it because. Frankly, if if anything were to happen, which I know it wouldn't behind right. the wheel, like if I weren't to wear it, I would be fine. But frankly, right. I want that to be there. Right, right. But if you don't want it to be there, that that that's on you if something goes wrong. <laughs> I like, know. That's the, way, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah, and and it's kind of funny how you know people like oh, and the way he put it, I say, why do you want to be a police officer? And he's like, because I want to do the right thing. I want to, you know, <laughs> and and oh my god, I'm like. Well, at least his head is somewhat in the right place where he at least is good intentioned right now. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how... Right now. That's how all, you know, um, tyranny occurs. That's how it starts is with people yeah. having the right intentions but just not thinking about what they're doing. You know, he's, you know, I guess he basically wants to be a tool for politicians um, without thinking, right? Because... Once you start thinking, you really can't be a good cop. You know, to me, a good cop is a quit cop. You, it's no such thing. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I really wish I, I had a little more time to talk to him, and I hope I gave him something to think about. I don't know. One can only hope. Do you, do you have do you have these kind of conversations with people in public? Oh, sometimes? I've, had, I've had lots of convert, dude. I go to college, so yeah, <laughs> I've, I've. So tell I've me, I've quite quite many conversations. Yeah, so, so tell me about the college uh, atmosphere. Where you're going? Is it? Pretty socialist and pretty uh, speech censoring, all the, the safe rooms and everything. Uh, yeah, but not as bad as other places. Like, I look at some of the stories coming out of all these higher end universities, and mm-hmm. I go to a community college, so you have to imagine, like, for the most part, like, the greater majority of people just don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so basically, even if it kind of is there, but mm-hmm. no one really cares. Like, there, there, there's one guy I know, and there's he's a big Donald Trump supporter. Uh-huh. And yet, strangely enough, we're both on the same side whenever in, we're in class because we're in a class class of with like an SJW professor, and with all these like progressive liberal people. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those situations where okay, I don't like you, and you don't like me, but. We can agree on X, Y, and Z, and we got to fend all of them off, man. Like, we, 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 have a, we have a common enemy, right? <clears throat> yeah, we share this common enemy. I never thought I'd go, going side by side with a libertarian for Trump. So do you find yourself um, self-censoring when you're at... When you're, no. Or, or no. You, are you freely speak your mind with people? I, I've gotten to the point where I just don't give a shit. I'll speak my mind. Uh-huh. But... Um, the funny thing was, like that Trump guy, he was trying to to rustle some jimmies because he found out that apparently you can't wear a Donald Trump shirt on campus because it's listed under the hate speech shirts shirts that you're not allowed to wear. Really? Is it? Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but apparently it is. Wow. And he he wore the shirt to campus trying to be all edgy and shit, <laughs> and I don't think it really resulted in anything because. Uh. I'll be honest, no one gives a shit enough to actually do anything. <laughs> like, sure, there's some comments here and there about, like, man, what the fuck's wrong? Like, of course there's comments, but, like, 
no one's actively going out of their way to do anything crazy. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, in some sense that's a good thing. Um, you know, it's like it's like in, in order for um, a paradigm to change, you really need a very passionate minority, maybe like ten percent, maybe fifteen percent of people, right, to really change the mentality of the herd. Because most people they just go along with whatever is popular, whatever other people are doing, right? That, that, that's the problem: is the social justice culture has kind of been shoved in our faces and become somewhat th- something popular. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, and yeah, I guess that's uh, that is part of our job: is to uh, you know talk some sense, talk some economics. Um, we are the counterculture, my friend. We are the counter economy. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I love the idea of agorism. You know, I, I bring that up a lot to people about, um, you know, it's it's very simple. You know, it's like um, living your life outside the state, raising your kids outside of the state, um, transacting outside of the state, having a business outside of the state, right? Everything you do outside of the state. And I think that's so important um, to disempower and, uh, you know, eviscerate the idea of statism, right? Because it only exists by people, first of all, paying taxes, but also people giving it legitimacy, right? So we do both. And uh, and so, you know, the idea is to, you know, just g- gently show people that, you know, yeah, you can live pretty well, you know, without paying your, your tithe and your homage. <laughs> One of my favorite memes I saw recently is of uh, Obama in like a gangster outfit you might have seen it uh, maybe it was on your page is that i, I believe it was my good <laughs> that was really awesome <laughs> you got it's almost april you got my money bitch yeah i loved it <laughs> did you make that one i didn't make that that was actually one that i had seen i had saw and i was it was too funny for me not to reshare <laughs> yeah i mean i mean it is it is like that. I mean it's 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 funny how like uh, you now now it's tax season, right? Now it's theft season and so people are saying, "Did you do your taxes? Did you do your taxes? Did you do your taxes?" And uh, it's like it's like it's like a, a very nice euphemism, you know. It's more like, you know, did, did you give them your blood money? Did you give them your blood money? <laughs> you know. Did you give daddy his money? It's 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 important to say things as it is. I think that's one thing that 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 I took away from uh from uh, Stefan Molyneux, he's always he's always saying, you know, his favorite um, Confucius saying, the beginning of wisdom is in calling things by their proper names, right? We yes. must dispense with political euphemisms and get people to see what's really going on, right? As as I'm sure he would say in the tax situation, you're you're the cattle giving the farmer his uh, his yield, his yeah. milk. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, chain slavery has been abolished, but um, free range slavery is still around, and and it has been expanded to include everybody. Are uh, Are you familiar with Robert Nozick at all? Yeah, a little bit. I actually um, have you heard his "The Tale of a Slave"? I believe it is. Yeah. I might be wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, that's really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, you just reminded me of that. And. Uh, just learned about that not too long ago. At what yeah. point does one stop? Did this stop being the story of a slave? Right, right. I, I first heard about that through uh, Tom Woods. Um, he mentioned that, and uh, yeah, it's really, really, really amazing. Like, um, and I guess going along the same lines, um, it, if you know, one question you, you can tell people um, on campus, I guess, uh, is if a hundred percent of your of your wealth is stolen, that's chain slavery. You know. Um, and zero percent is complete freedom. At what percentage is it not slavery? Right. <laughs> at what percent? And uh, I think that's it's important for people to understand. It's not. It's not how much is being taxed, right? This, like this is what the politicians are fighting over. You know, we should we should steal this much from them. We should steal that much from them. This is where the stolen money should go. No, that's where the stolen money should go. <laughs> and I think it's important for. For anarchists and and uh, and, and agorists and voluntarists to point out, maybe the problem is in the theft, right? <laughs> Not maybe, the... maybe the problem lies in the fact that we're taking the money instead of letting people invest it freely in the market in businesses and solutions that could better their community and their lives. 
<laughs> and you and you say that and uh and you shut mean, up mimsy i mean to me you know i guess to us it sounds completely natural and second nature makes sense but it's amazing how something as simple as that um is so difficult to grasp like no, i think i think the thing is it's too, it sounds too simple for people to really wrap their head around so they think because it's so simple it must be utopian right yeah and, and one one thing that's important to point out to people when they object to that is if you object or if you advocate for the restriction of other people's freedoms, eventually other people will advocate for the restriction of your freedoms, right? It's it's always that boomerang effect. You know, it's it's never a one way. Everybody everybody's always vying to be, you know, um masters over the other other uh over the other portion of the population, right? As uh, Lysander Spurs says, right? You know, advocating for government is always a contest, you know, between master and slave, in which one po- one portion is master, the other portion is slave, and <laughs> and that's civilization, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Lysander Spurs. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you read any of, any of his? Uh, I listened to the audio book for no treason back in high school. Wow. Awesome. I, there were there were there were a lot of times where um, I was in study halls, and honestly, I had the opportunity to listen to a lot of that sort of stuff. Well, tell me tell me about um, your experience in in government school. I, I always like to hear that from people. <laughs> that wasn't government school. That was actually the private one. But, oh, um, you went to private. I see. I see. My my experience. I, I you know I've actually gone to every type of school you could think of. Except I've never done homeschooling fully, Mm -hmm. but I've done like classes outside. And honestly, the whole the way the state has that set up, I just don't enjoy it. Like the way they have the virtual schooling thing, it's just it seems very it's very impractical for someone like myself. Mm -hmm. If you can manage to play that game, all power to you. Just not my cup of tea. But um, but the thing is, there there were those private. There was one private school that was good, but. There was also a religious school which led me to atheism by the end, ironically. So, so all these private but, schools were religious? No, one of them was religious. One of them actually wasn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was actually um, no, no religion, just, just a private school, which I believe got bought out by a corporation not too long ago, mm-hmm. which some people say was a bad thing. But uh, honestly, I don't see that as a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but... To, I'm going off on a tangent there, but yeah, pro- public schools are horrible. <laughs> um, one of the ways I made my name in Liberty was by videotaping an army propaganda thing that my graphic arts class had to endure. Really? So basically, they uh. took us onto this bus and let us through this pseudo Call of Duty simulation. It's still on YouTube if you ever want to see that. I could send that to you after this. Yeah, yeah, I'll include that in the in the notes. Sure. It, fuck yeah, but um, <laughs> basically. It's this pseudo like Call of Duty simulation, and it, it was just r- so ridiculous that I couldn't help but just take my camera out and videotape this. Nice. And it was just ridiculous. It was hilarious. So, it so was, what, what do you mean? What do you mean Call of Duty simulation? It, like you're in a simulating machine simulator? You're in like a simulator, and it's like some sort of pseudo Call of Duty Halo hmm. thing trying to get us to join the military, I guess. Wow. And by the end of this, I'm just like I'm co- I'm confounded with how ridiculous this actually is. <laughs> like my my dad isn't an anarchist by any ex- extent, but I remember when I showed him this after this before I uploaded it. Mm-hmm. He even kind of made a joke about the one word that the general has. And remember, we need to avoid civilian fire, avoid f- killing civilians. Yeah. My dad made the joke. Like I just imagine the guy in the background was just like, no, 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 Tom, come on, come on, come on, be serious. <laughs> <laughs> like. Wow. Uh, so, so, so you, so you didn't, you didn't like believe it at all, like the propaganda. Oh like, no! Like, it got even worse at the end. I uh, didn't videotape this one, but I felt like I should have had my camera when I for it. But uh-huh. literally, uh, my senior year, I was at a public high school again, mm-hmm. and for the last like few weeks, somewhere in there, they showed us a convent, a um, an assembly for don't do drugs. Like this was all in one day, one assembly, like of matter of like two hours it was the assembly to not do drugs support the troops don't drink and drive um 
always have wishful thinking <laughs> everything you can think of every assembly you had always brush your teeth um, every assembly you've had since you were in pre-k all rolled into one nice right before you graduate. nice Make, make sure you don't, don't forget it. Including the extremely unmotivated motivational speaker to come in right at the end. <laughs> Unmotivation. <laughs> like this guy was crippled and like the, they show the video of the guy the, of how the guy got crippled. And then he just comes in on there not looking like he gives a fuck like, uh, yeah, it's good to party. Just don't go too crazy. <laughs> and then he just fucking leaves. <laughs> nice. like, everything rolled into one. <laughs> Nice, uh, nice, and uh, don't question. Uh, you know, believe everything the politicians say. Don't question anything. Just pay your taxes, obey the law, and you'll be fine. <laughs> oh yeah, I believe there was also something in there about taxation not being theft. <laughs> oh man, but that's uh, wow, that's, that's interesting though. That uh, yeah, I, I um, I remember Mike in my high school. I went to a, I went to a government school and. Um, I did not do JROTC, um, but I did get uh, some calls from these recruiters, and you know it's, they're they're pretty persistent, you know, and they they, they called a couple times, and uh, yeah, they it, it's amazing, you know, how people think sending your kids to government school is such a benign thing, but um, but really, you know, when you look into the history of of uh, of, of government schooling and um, you know institutionalized schooling, um, you realize that the 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 first reason that they started doing it was to make, um, you know, conformist uh, order um, order followers, right? Um, people who just obey orders without thinking, right? That was the reason, modeled after the the Prussian system, and um, and and it's just sinister, you know. And it's just it's only gotten worse since then. Um, and it's amazing. Like I, I also interviewed Katie Chaos. You familiar with her, Katie Chaos? She has a, a, a YouTube channel. That name rings a bell for some reason. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's she's pretty um, pretty uh, pretty good channel, and she's a she's a uh, a government school teacher. She's going to ret- you know um, uh, leave quite soon, but but uh, you know she's an anarcho- uh, anarchist uh, volunteerist, and uh, and that's one thing that she that she was saying how how amazingly persistent and you know with the propaganda those recruiters are, and um, you know how they come in, they just want to whisk you away, you know, free education you get to see the world you know you, you get you know amazing experiences you can serve your country you can do you know be a brave courageous person it's amazing how they they cloak they cloak all the um you know all of the uh, you know the what the military is all about you know in this very nice language well the funny part is i never think that the recruiters for the most part all the ones that i've met have ever actually they know what they're get what they're selling to the people. I don't think they actually know the full scope of what the experience that they are selling to them. You know what I mean? And cuz like a lot of these people who were recruiting at my place, they were young, man. They were about how old I am now. Really? Oh, that old, that young. Wow. There was only one of them who was actually like actually seemed like he could have been in the military at some point. Like the rest of them seemed like about my age. Hmm. Wow. Maybe probably older, if I'd have to say. Like saying my young, young, my young one is that's probably more of a liberal estimate. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the other thing I remember uh, hearing about is that the the brain, the human brain, um, only really fully matures at around age twenty five, which kind of makes sense because so many so many kids who go into the military, let's say seventeen, eighteen years old, you know, they're overseas and they've already done you know horrific acts. Um, that they're that they res- that they regret and and they're like why am I here what did I just do you know and then and, and it's so common to just realize after the fact like like why am I here and I shouldn't be here and then they come home you know PTSD and all that and you know with their drinking problem and, and everything and and so it's uh, <laughs> it's a very sad state of affairs yeah 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 so uh, all right yeah definitely we'll include that video. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, the de- description below, um, but uh, but please go into your um, the the ICHA Foundation I C H A Foundation dot com yeah the, the and, International Coalition for Human Action right that one yeah <laughs> and just tell uh, you know t- tell my listeners what that's about and uh, and uh, you know and how you how you came to be associated with them 
Yeah, I'm kind of uh, an, an in-house graphic artist for them. And um, basically, the International Coalition for Human Action is a coalition of all these things known as Geo Libres, which are, is kind of a term to describe, excuse me, it's a term to describe sort of a free market autonomous zone. And this could be lo as loosely this could be this is loose enough to describe one that could be maybe be totally ANCAP, like the Free State Project, or one you may have never heard of, um, Lieberstadt in Norway. Mm. Both and but both very ANCAP. Cool. But then you have more um, classical liberal like ones, like um, li like Lieberland, if you're familiar with that one. Yeah. Or Lieberland. Yeah. Yeah. And um, which it is interesting to note too. Lieber Lieberland does have a provision in their const in um, I think their constitution that says that um, every ten years they must vote on whether to dissolve the government or not. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the government must vote on. Is it okay, guys? Is it time for us to dissolve? Is it time for us to go away? Right, right, right. That is like the best provision. <laughs> like, I'm not all for statism, but you know, get, gotta give them that. At least they have that in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it is definitely an interesting thing. And and I remember, uh, I think Jeff Berwick was talking to him and and saying how people call him, uh, you know, a little bit hypocritical because you know it's, here he is an, an anarchist, and he made a country, right? And, and oh, Acapulco. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think he talked to him there. No, no, That's no. That's actually another place we work with with Icha, but sorry, go on. Oh, yeah? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, how do you, you know, square that circle? You know, you're an anarchist, but you just made a country. And he's like, well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, we, we live in a world dominated by nation states. And, uh, you know, you have to declare yourself as a country, but, but I guess they're not really operating as a government. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't really think I know enough about it, you know. But uh, it sounds like a pretty, um, uh, you know, pretty nice effort to to um, you know achieve some freedom for people who want to go live there and live a little bit more free. So, yeah, there's a few different that was maybe that was maybe that was back when he was trying to do Galt's Gulch, but now that's Freedom Gulch, which is a whole different project entirely. So, oh, it's Freedom Gulch now. Is it it's a whole different project entirely now. Actually, Galt's Gulch is gone. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Gold's Gulch is gone. Um, that entire project went down due to some uh, very not fun stuff that happened with the guy um, stealing a bunch of the. There, there was a lot of yeah. dirty law. There was a lot of bad lawsuits. It was a very messy situation. And out of the remains of it, a bunch of people went and created a new place called Freedom Gulch, where basically mm. they provided a lot of things that the original Gold's Gulch did not have. Which uh, the new Freedom Gulch is actually a part of Icha. Oh okay, cool. yeah, the internet. They're in the coalition. Cool. So, so the so the each is just um like a website where it brings all these together, like a central hub. Yeah, but we also um, are do a lot of other things. For instance, this summer we are going to be having our first summit, the Startup Society Summit. And where is that going to be? Uh, that is going to be in Port, uh, I believe, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Cool. Which that actually has its own site as well. The for the summit. Oh, okay. The, so you guys are also associated with the Free State Project, right? Yeah, the Free State Project is also associated with each. Yeah. We are fast. We are very fast growing. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I love that there's these little little communities popping up everywhere of uh, you know freedom-minded people, and uh, you know my my wife is kind of uh, nervous to them because it's like it's like if the government wanted to you know drone bomb a couple bunch of anarchists, they know where to find them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it wouldn't be a problem for them to cover it up either. They are a bunch of anarchists. Yeah. I'm sure they pick up some crazy shit. I mean, there's already white, I've already seen white journalism of journalists saying that ISIS were reaching out to anarchists who rioted in Ferguson. Really? <laughs> you know, I'm no idiot. I mean, I'm no ANCOM, but I can, not anymore anyways, but I can pretty much figure out that I'm pretty sure they wouldn't join ISIS. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm pretty sure they joined the Kurds, if anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, it's. I, I think. I, I think it is important, you know, for us to, um, you know, to find our tribe, and um, you know, move move next to people where we don't have to constantly be defending ourselves, and you know, um, 
you know, defending against other people's attacks or, you know, misconceptions or fallacies, you know, it's fun, but it's also exhausting, right? And it's just nice. It's it's nice sometimes to just live near your own, uh, you know, not not your own blood family necessarily, but your own ideological family. (laughs) It's kind kind of weird how anarchism has, um, has, what's the word I'm trying to look for? It's kind of brought forward this sort of culture like that. Because yeah. uh, have have you ever seen the documentary uh, Anarchism in America? No. I highly recommend looking it up. It shows it kind of covers both collectivist anarchism and individualist anarchism, and it's very fair to both. So it's not really that bad. My only gripe is there is one wrong fact in there, which is that uh, Peter uh, Peter Peter Kropotkin mm-hmm. and um, Michael Bakunin did not. Uh, coined the term anarchism that was actually Pierre Proudhon. Mm-hmm. But other than that, the entire documentary is great. But it even kind of shows that sort of culture that has really came up around anarchism when it came in to the U.S. around mm-hmm. the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. So collective anarchist, collectivist anarchists are the anarcho-communists, right? Uh, no, anarcho-collectivism is actually different. Um, then that one, you still... You you still work. You get what you work for. You still make what you work for, and there still is money, mm-hmm. but it's still collectivist based. Mm-hmm. In anarcho communism, there is no money. Money is evil. Right. Um, property is, property is evil. Everyone gets their fair share. Right. Theory. Yeah. There's all these like little differences between all the leftist ones. It's kind of funny. Yeah. You you know I used to I used to um you know, firmly be in the camp of the, you know, anarcho-capitalist. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I guess if you really push me, I, I would still say I'm an anarcho-capitalist. But I've I've come to the conclusion that it's not really necessary to have the hyphen. You know, I'm just fine with the general term anarchist and voluntarist. I think it's less confusing for people. I think the the simpler that we can explain our philosophy, the the more uh, the more likely, you know, it will be understood by other people, right? So, so exactly, I, and I'm not going to lie. That's another reason why I do like agorism as well. Is um, it's not very a threatening word. It's yeah. not one that I can go onto a college campus and say, say to like a group of SJWs and like not and automatically have them closed off to it. No, they'll listen then because they don't know what it is. They're, at that point, they're genuinely curious with what you have to say. Mm. If you say you're advocating capitalism, right. you're generally going to close off a lot oh. of minds oh, yeah. before you could even start the next sentence. Definitely, yeah. It's just the way things work. So let me ask you, uh, what is your definition uh, that you tell people of what agorism is? Agorism, I, I use, I kind of elaborate on the Greek definition. The purest definition is just the, um, that it's the Greek place for markets and ideas and uh, the, for the exchange of markets and ideas. I kind of use that, but then I, I build off it to kind of show how this is a free market. This is a sort of um, free place for exchange. This is where Socrates went to do his thing. But also here in our, our modern day, we also have counter economics, which plays into agorism as well. Counter economics being the way we used, um, sorry, <laughs> but um, counter economics being the uh, method we use to choke the state, uh, utilizing gray and black markets basically, um, avoid the tax man at all costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, uh, it's, it's really an it's, awesome way to transact and to live. Um, I mean, I understand black markets has kind of a negative connotation. You know, people think of like crime and and you know. Um, I actually have a very interesting thing with that, and that's another reason why I like Agorism. Is um, it really, if you you think about it enough, like think about the ideas that are presented to you by Konkin, by by his predi- by the people who built off his works, and aside, I said, well, I'm trying to remember the specific person who made the chart, but. Um, you basically have this chart that divides the markets into five markets. And aside yeah, from yeah, white, I, I, I saw that one. It, and gray it's, a, it's an awesome chart. Yeah, go ahead. The red it's, market. Yeah, yeah. Pink market. Right. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. When, I, when I first saw that chart, that's the first time I, re- I really understood the concept of five markets. So, <laughs> did, did you make that one, by the way? Well, it really helps. No, I didn't make that. That was that was made by 
that was made long ago before I even discovered agorism. Oh, okay. I, I don't know who made that, but I, I honestly should ask Daniel Shulman, the guy who he actually knew Sam Lee Lord Conkin, and and, uh, and I know him. He oh. wrote alongside Knight the Agorist fiction novel. Nice. But um, yeah, good good guy. But he might actually have it. He'll, he'll know who who made that. I can honestly just look it up after this. I just yeah. I honestly don't remember who it was off the top of my head. But really, it's it's a nice chart because it really helps different. Like, cause let's face it, there's a difference between Al Chapo and some guy who's selling weed out of his apartment just to make money to get to get right. by. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's well, there's there's just such a big difference. Like, they're not the same. Right. It's not the same situation. One guy has made his empire y- y- by y- literally y- killing off its competition. One guy's just doing it to pay the bills. Y- your, your little friend selling weed is not paying off uh, police officers and the and the DEA. <laughs> not bribing yeah. them to leave to leave him alone, you know. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, there's a little little bit a little bit of a difference, right? <laughs> yeah, very big difference. And like once you get into the some of the like some of the more sick elements of things, like you have hitmen and yeah. Like all these other weird things that just like in- involve human aggression, mm-hmm. and like yes, they're still legal, but generally you don't really consider them black market because of all that stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point um, yeah. because you know people, yeah, yeah the uh, you know black the idea of black market has a very negative connotation, right? Because that's immediately what people think of, like gang, you know, violent gangs and shootings, and you know, and like you said, hitmen and things like that. Um, or like when I talk about the dark net with people, you know, and I, and I say, and I say, yeah, I mean, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, horrible things that you can buy on the dark net, you know, including hitmen. Um, but, uh, but there are also people that just want to transact outside of the state, right? Use Bitcoin. And, and, you know, so I, I tell people, I think it, I think it's a wonderful thing. And, and if you really think that the dark net is a problem because there are hitmen, then you should have a bigger problem with the U.S. military. All right, <laughs> stop being afraid. <laughs> and 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 you know, Obama with the drones, like like you're afraid of one hitman from the dark net, but you're not afraid of you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of order followers who are willing to go overseas and you know, kick down people's doors and raid people and you know, just murder people who they never met just because they're following the orders. Like you're not afraid of that, <laughs> but you're afraid. Of, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, it's kind of funny how the dark web has brought up all these horror stories and stuff. But honestly, I, I've never I've never had any reason to utilize it. I've only been on there once, literally just to see what it was like, because see what the whole what the whole buzz was about. Never really used it for anything though. And um, I, I think it would be interesting for someone to go through there and take down a ta- uh, like do like a scoreboard. Of things on there that are black market and things on there that are red markets. Mm-hmm. Right. Let's see which one is more on the dark web. Because honestly, I think the red market elements would be a lot less than what we think. Can you can you for for the for the listeners who are not familiar with the five markets? Can you just like it's not very uncommon nowadays for. Right. Right. So so yeah, for our listeners who are not familiar have... who are not familiar with the five markets, can you just quickly explain them? The five markets. Yeah, we have the white market, which is legal market. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Um, okay, cool. But you have the white market, which is the um, legal market, which we regularly purchase things from, or m- many people do. And then you have the gray market, which is um, it's um, generally un untaxed, unregulated stuff, but the government doesn't really get involved in that. They don't really have any reason to go after it. Like, generally, this is things like flea markets, just Craigslist for the most part. Ah, uh, okay. Even though there's still some black market stuff that leaks onto Craigslist, yeah, I'm sure there's some red market stuff on Craigslist as well. Craigslist is a weird place, but um, <laughs> but but anyways, yeah, the gray market is uh, that is also one that agorists like to utilize. I myself love to go to flea markets, swap meets, play things like that. Mm-hmm. There's almost never any taxes involved at places like that, for the most part. Aside from that, which is paid to the person who owns the property itself. So, so it's mostly just but, ca- um, mostly cash at those. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. For the most part, yeah. Cool. But um, but after that, then you have the black market, which encompasses um, just black trade of things that the government does not want 
being regu- being around at all. In this one, you get a lot of drugs, a lot of guns, but it doesn't guarantee violence. It's just simply there. Mm-hmm. Um, the red market, on the other hand, which is below that, is a place where you will find things like hitmen, um, snuff films, sex slavery, just things that require human aggression. Wait, so snuff films? What, what is that? Those are like, um, that's a, like a type of, don't, why, why are you making me describe this? <laughs> um, oh, you sick bastard. Um, I, I, sorry, it's for the listeners. <laughs> I, I understand, I understand. Uh, it's basically a perverted type of film of someone doing illicit acts on someone who is dead, bleeding, or... Ah, I, 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 honestly, I see, I see, I see. Okay. I, yeah, you see what I mean, like... There's a word for that. Shit for, there, there's a word for that. I, I forget the name of it. Yeah, okay, a specific word for that. All right. Well, like, snuff film is the way I've always... I, that's just what I've always heard. Okay. <clears throat> like, that's, right. that's just the, the term that I've always heard to describe it. But that that's a very red market industry. It requires <laughs> killing people requires aggression like uh, yeah big time <laughs> yeah oh well, even things like pedophilia rings it's it's a pure red market thing like, right, right right there's a reason why agris near it it requires aggression it goes uh, mm. even for those of you who were big on the non-aggression principle it goes beyond the non-aggression principle yep oh yeah it's not something we approve no way <laughs> but then right next to that right beside that you have the pink market which is the government's is like the government's version of the red market. Hmm. Which would be which the, is where you like the war on terror. You mean? Yeah, the war on terror definitely encompasses that. I'm sure also Iran Contra would fall under that. Mm-hmm. The way the government has fucked around in black markets and red markets over the years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, talking about. Um the red market um and those like like child, child pornography and sex slavery and all that kind of stuff you know I, there's this um this one guy on facebook who regularly um trolls my posts and uh, and and says basically you know you anarchists don't know what you're asking for you know you all you all want child prostitution and sex slavery that's what you that's what you want isn't it <laughs> and uh yeah God, I, know, no. I, I know i know i <laughs> know just just because there are no rulers doesn't mean there's no rules. <laughs> right, right. Um and and I mean I mean it's it's important to to note that um you know just because there's no coercive central authority, you know, you still have the natural market forces of 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 um you know, uh you know, raiding agencies and you know, um uh, ostracism, you know, boycotting, you know, things like that. Um, that play a pretty good role in, uh, you know, limiting people's immoral behavior. Um, and so I'm not really, you know, I'm not really afraid of that. You know, it's like, it's like if you're afraid of, uh, you know, a lone hitman or a lone psychopath, you should be against the U.S. military, right? If if you're afraid of... You know, uh, the funny thing... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. That's right, that's from- right the hitman thing again i just thought i should say this yeah. i was watching this one guy who was doing deep web explorations on youtube uh-huh. where literally he was just videotaping himself and his reactions going on to different things and every hitman site he goes on and i have to agree with him like they all look like fbi honeypots like they have like fixed rates and stuff and like it's just when you think about it, it's like if you were a hitman would you really have fixed rates like that <laughs> i mean you have to figure you're like every one of these things has to be different. Like right, right, right. There's no way it's just that simple to give someone a fixed rate on all this stuff. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know. I know. It's uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, profession <laughs> to be. In. But um, but yeah. So so when people tell me, you know, what about a rapist? If you were an alleyway and there's no police and you don't believe in government and you have a rapist, I'm like, I'm like, all right. So you you're afraid of rape. All right. So then you should be against prisons <laughs> you know security servants right. se- uh, security services still exist of course they do yeah that, definitely you know people they um act first we'll work it out later 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, people like, like I'm going to interview this guy Dale Brown from uh, the Detroit Threat Management. Uh, I'm pretty excited, um, Viper, yeah, the Viper guy. So really, really excited to talk to him about about that kind of uh, stuff because, you know, you know, you, you know, you, I think I think it's like um, um, private security outnumbers um, uh, law enforcement like you know two thirds to one third, right? But you don't you don't see. Um, you know, videos on YouTube of, of private security, you know, let's say mall security people accidentally, you know, breaking people's arms or, <laughs> or tasing them to death or, you know, kicking, you know, kicking pregnant women or, you know, you don't see that, right? <laughs> you don't. And Cause there's a, there's an, for, I'm not going to lie. You meet a lot of private company assholes too, but that's at any profession that you, that you work with. But honestly, in that case, you just you, a lot of them don't really have an incentive on power. No way. Like nope. none of them are tripping balls on their power of the state. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They don't have as many leeways. Definitely, definitely. That's it's a major. That's a majoring hindering factor um, for how they can act. You know the accountability uh, that they have as a private business um, that uh, law enforcement simply does not have. Right? They're, they're their funds are guaranteed at the point of a gun, right? So, so they have no, they have no obligation to protect anybody or their property whatsoever, right? And uh, you know, they're basically they're they're you know the only obligation they do have is to enforce, you know, politicians' scribbles, right? That's that's about it. Um, the people definitely come second, and and if you kind of divorce what people, you know, if people try to divorce what they see in Hollywood, how cops act. And then see how they act in real life. <laughs> You'll realize that very quickly. So, um, but yeah. Um, so, yeah. so is there anything else that you wanted to um, to say? Any, any other message you want to say to my my listeners before we uh, close up? I don't want to keep you any longer. Yeah. Um, really, just go check out Agarus Ball. Go check out. Um, that newest experiment of ours, Captain Anarchy, um, our little attempt to do a little superhero thing, <laughs> or my little attempt. <laughs> Why am I speaking in collectivist? <laughs> so, so, so you're going to be making but, um, you're going to be making comics for that for the Captain Anarchy. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of my little, just a little, little experiment on the side there. I guess you could say. Feels it feels weird to be back on voluntary virtues again. <laughs> <laughs> In case any of you don't know, I used to have a show on here called The Adorkable Anarchist World back when I was actually in high school. Man, good so, luck. I can't um, believe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. But um, if, you, if you'd ever want any graphic arts work done, feel free to contact my business page, Distance Arts, on Facebook. Distance Arts. Oh, that's the name of your, of your Facebook? Okay, cool. Oh. That, that's just the graphic arts page, like purely the graphic arts page, business your okay. business cool yeah so so do you have a small business with that now do you have some clients i don't really have any clients right now but it's just kind of um back when i i went to another school before the one i'm at now because long story with colleges yeah um basically they had to set up an entire thing for our business for like a a personal business thing and I ended up setting up Distance Arts, and the site is still out there on Flavors Me, but honestly, it's not up to date, and I've been eventually looking to create a better site, one that's more up to date. I mean, it still has me on there listed as someone who make, regularly makes videos on voluntary virtues, mm -hmm. which oh, really? isn't really the case. <laughs> so, so can we find um, samples of your work on there? On there, no. But if you wanted to find them on Voluntary Virtues, I know they're still on there. No, no. I mean uh, samples of your of your artwork. Oh yeah, yeah. You could find that on there. On there, there only yeah. I only put the best of my portfolio on there, though. So yeah, it's yeah. Very, it's, there's there isn't there isn't a shitload of stuff on there. All right, cool. Yeah, definitely include that in the uh, in the show notes so you can people can check you out over there. Um, awesome, oh, yeah. <clears throat> awesome conversation, Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so one thing I like to ask of my guests before uh, we sign off is, um, what's your favorite quote of all time? Favorite quote of all time. <laughs> Whew, 
It's a hard one. But there's <laughs> always one that just – there's two that pop into mind, one that's too long for me to think of off the top of my head and I'd have to look up, which is actually more of a – is referred to as the Chief Tecumseh poem if you're familiar with that. No. But another one is one – it's just more like an old saying and I don't know – actually said it but i've heard it somewhere and i've never been able to actually track it down but life is a comedy to those who life is a tragedy to those who think awesome yeah i like that one too as anarchists we need to laugh at the state we need to laugh at the state yes yes definitely i think um you know uh, when we when we learn about the state and what it actually is um i think the first inclination is to be angry and um Res, you know, resentful and frustrated, but but then after a while, you know, you realize, well, that's not going to get you very far. You know, you don't. You, people aren't attracted to your philosophy when they see your anger, right? Um, you know, I think we have to portray ourselves as 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 showing people that you know our philosophy is one of freedom. You know, we're we, you know we are anti-state, we are you know anti-war, um, you know all these kinds of things, but we are also pro-freedom, pro-peace, and pro-love, right? And I think that's important to uh, exactly to uh to get across for people because um you know i think that's the most important thing right you got to focus on focus on living fully and um and as uh as uh, you know as um he say invisibly uh to the state as possible <laughs> so <Yeah>. definitely <clears throat> awesome um so yeah if anybody wants to um help me out <clears throat> you can do so uh through bitcoin or patreon uh, or PayPal links are below. Uh, that's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. I really enjoy um, uh, uh, interviewing some fascinating people like uh, Mitchell here, and I really want to do more of it, and monetary compensation is appreciated. You know, uh, I'm, an, I'm a capitalist at, at the end, and I uh, respond to incentives like all like all businesses do. <laughs> and so any monetary compensation uh, will give me the right incentive. <laughs> <laughs> to do that more often. So uh, thanks a lot for coming to the show, Mitchell. I really appreciate it. Um, wonderful conversation. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at Get. Get cell411.com. That's getcell411.com.